about the MR of ischemic heart disease. Thank you, Reggie. I'm not going to try to cover all topics of MRI of ischemic heart disease in just 20 minutes, but I will cover what I think are some of the more important aspects. So what are the purposes of imaging in ischemic heart disease in general? Of course, to detect disease, to assess the severity of the disease, to define coronary anatomy and to direct therapy, and cardiac cath, of course, is very useful for directing therapy. Evaluation of revascularization after surgery or angioplasty, and a determination of myocardial viability. And MR has has the ability to do all of these, but the most important aspects, in my opinion, are to, uh, to evaluate viability and also perhaps to assess the severity of ischemic heart disease and detect disease. So MR can be used for global evaluation of ischemic heart disease. Some of these applications are better established and some are not as well established. MR can be used for regional perfusion, stress perfusion imaging, for example, regional functional evaluation, either at rest or stress, evaluation of myocardial viability and coronary MRA. Now I have a question for you. Which MR application is the most promising or perhaps most useful in your personal experience and in your opinion, which is the most useful for, uh, in the evaluation of ischemic heart disease? So over 60% are saying viability, and I agree with that. That's my personal opinion. In our practice, most of our cases for ischemic heart disease are referred for evaluation of viability. Coronary artery imaging is really not that good with MR currently, especially compared to CT as you've seen this morning. Okay, so let's start with perfusion imaging. The technique involves first pass imaging with gadolinium chelate contrast agent. This can be done at rest and stress. Exercise stress is actually possible in the magnet. However, it requires a special apparatus with a bicycle and it's somewhat cumbersome. Most institutions use pharmacologic stress. In other words, either adenosine or dipyridamol. Now, MR perfusion imaging can be more accurate than SPECT imaging, and it's been shown that the accuracy is similar to that of PET. The issue with perfusion imaging, though, is sometimes it's a little bit difficult to perform. Technically, it's not quite as easy as viability imaging, for example. So I don't think perfusion imaging is widespread nowadays, but it does have promise in the future. This is an example of perfusion imaging. You can see here, this is the myocardium. There is a perfusion defect there, and it's subendocardial. This is actually one advantage of MR over nuclear medicine techniques. The spatial resolution is so good that we are able to distinguish subendocardial perfusion defects from transmural defects. Okay, now it's been shown that MR has high sensitivity and specificity for evaluation of coronary artery disease, especially for three vessel disease, but even for one vessel or two vessel disease, quite good in the 80 plus percent range. And this is not as good as perhaps coronary CT for detection of stenosis. However, this is better than SPECT imaging in general. So it's better than nuclear medicine, more accurate. And an ROC curve demonstrates that MRI does perform better than SPECT, in case you didn't believe me the first time I said it. Okay. Now, compared to PET, PET is considered the gold standard for viability, but for perfusion, it's also considered to be outstanding. And comparing MR versus PET and using coronary angiography as the gold standard it's been shown that MR and PET perform in a similar fashion on the ROC curve. This is another example of an MR, but again, an advantage of MR over PET 
is that we can see the extent of involvement. So there's perfusion defect that is not transmural in this case. That's corresponding to this angiogram with the stenosis. So let's move on and talk about functional imaging now. Now functional imaging, what we're talking about is wall motion. And this can be done at rest and stress. If you do functional imaging at rest, it's actually quite nice for quantification of volumes. So left and right ventricular volumes, you can look at the end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, stroke volume, ejection fraction. And for stress, you can do a stress functional image looking at the wall motion. It's been shown that MR is more accurate than stress echocardiography in patients who have moderate quality stress echo. So in some patients, stress echo is considered to be high quality, especially thin patients. And in those individuals, stress echo and MR perform in a similar way. Most patients, though, MR is better. One of the issues with MR, though, is that because dobutamine is used for functional imaging, for stress MR, for the wall motion, it's somewhat difficult to perform this exam. And why is that? Because dobutamine, it puts the patient at risk for developing ischemia and perhaps an infarct, myocardial infarction, and it requires close monitoring. At the slightest change in the wall motion or in the slightest patient symptoms, uh, we have to be very careful. And because the patient is inside the MR suite and inside the bore of the magnet, it's somewhat difficult to monitor. And for that reason, I don't think that functional imaging is widespread. We don't do this at our institution. There are some institutions that do it routinely, but you do have to have some experience and confidence with the monitoring. And this slide shows that, that MR, stress perfusion MR has good sensitivity and specificity for coronary artery disease. And the same thing with three vessel disease, there was 92% sensitivity. With one vessel disease, it was lower, 75%, but overall 83% sensitivity. This is an example of stress MR courtesy of uh, Greg uh, Hunley. You can see here there is relatively poor wall thickening. This is the baseline study. This is the low level stress image and this is the peak stress. And look particularly at this area as the movie plays. There's a good thickening here at low level stress, but at peak stress there is poor thickening in the septum. And that indicates that there is ischemia there in the septum at peak stress. Okay, let's spend the remainder of the time on viability imaging. Now, viable, of course, means living. Now, late enhancement is what we're looking for, delayed enhancement. What does this mean in particular? It means that we inject the gadolinium chelate contrast agent, then we scan seven to 10 minutes later. And why are we gonna wait seven to 10 minutes later? Because we wanna look for the non-viable tissue. And how do we differentiate viable from non-viable? Well, you can inject the gadolinium. The gadolinium goes into the myocardium and then it washes out of the normal myocardium. So any myocardium that's either normal, completely normal, or living is going to have a washout of the gadolinium. But in patients with an area of non-viable or infarcted myocardium, those areas will not wash out. The non-viable areas do not wash out. The gadolinium remains there. And seven to 10 minutes later, after gadolinium injection, we will be able to differentiate between the washed out areas, which is viable, versus the non-washed out areas, which are non-viable. And what are we gonna do? We inject the gadolinium and you're waiting seven to 10 minutes. What should you do in the meantime? Well, what we usually do, is we do a perfusion study, which requires a low dose of gadolinium, usually 0.05 millimoles per kilogram 
we do that first pass per fusion, and then we inject another 0.05 millimeter.